Good morning, church. Special blessing today. Good to have Bob Bernicke back with us. He's on that side of the congregation. <laughs> Everything in my world is turned around. <laughs> but good to have you back, Bob. Though you're feeling better, very happy to see you as well. Thank you for making the effort to be here. And I hear it's a special day for you. Is that correct? Yeah? <laughs> Birthdays are still special? Okay. <laughs> good. Um, in way of announcements, uh, just, just a reminder, all of the stuff that goes on for the Christmas, like the uh, Project We Care, Christmas Cheer, all of those things are due next Sunday, by next Sunday, so that they can get out to the various places that they need to go. Um, I was asked to remind you that there was a day change from earlier on the Christmas caroling. It is on Wednesday night now, the 17th. Wednesday the 17th, not Thursday as it was originally uh, intended. Uh, that date has been changed. Most of you should have gotten in the mail, if you lived in the Napoleon area, the postcard for the Candy Cane Workshop. Uh, there are a stack of extras that were printed over there. If you uh, know of someone who did not get a card, if you put a stamp on it and their address, maybe a little note, write on it or whatever, you can send one to them or, or whatever, but those are available over on the table uh, in the alcove there. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Choir, would you lead us in worship? Congregation, join me in the dedication of our candle. May we hold fast to the hope offered in God's promise of salvation. May our hope in God allow us to dream God's dreams and see God's visions. May this hope shine into our broken world and bring light into our darkness. May this hope be instilled into the hearts of our children so that they too may see their future in the hands of God and realize the blessings of salvation from on high. Our candle today is the candle. 
candle of hope. It is hope for you. Our hopes are in you. You are what will follow us in your lives as you grow up. You have your families, and you worship God, and you serve God. So today, as we think about hope, we're very mindful of each of you because you represent much of that hope for us. You may return to your pews. The word has become flesh and lived among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, offering hope for our world. Would you please this morning take a moment and share in hope with one another your greetings to each other as we continue our worship. I'm this morning's call to <coughs> worship from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead your people, stir your might and come to save us. We us, O Lord, our hosts. Let your face shine and the enemy to save. O Lord of hosts, how long will you ignore your people's prayers? How long will your people eat from the bread of weeping and drink from the cup? Filled with tears. You brought a vine out of Egypt. It took root and filled the land and sent its branches to the sea and covered the mountains with its shade. Turn again, O battle hosts, look around from heaven to the sea, have regard for this vine. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. We restore us, O Lord of our hosts. Let your face shine and bring us your day. Together let us pray. O God, God beyond all time, we are an impatient people. As the days grow shorter and the darkness longer, teach us to wait with faithful expectation. In this time of worship, open our eyes and hearts to the wonder of Advent and help us prepare for your holy presence in our midst. Teach us to make each day a day of gratitude for your compassion and grace. Through the guidance of your spirit, be in one of us in the pathways that make for peace. In the name of Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
The season of Advent calls us to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord into the world. The anticipation of this coming led us to respond to God's grace and rekindle our desire to be awakened from our slumber and ready ourselves for our soon coming King. O oh God of our salvation, we admit that we need to be awakened again to your salvation. We confess that we need to lay aside the works of darkness that creep their way to our lives. Break it through our slumber, rescue us from our selfish ways, open our ears, sharpen our sight, lose our minds, awaken our zeal, arouse our love, reveal yourself in glory. Help us see your glory. Help us hear your instruction. Help us understand and renew your ways. Help us renew our devotion. Help us increase our love and compassion. Help us anticipate your visitation. Come among us, O God, and hear our prayers that we might walk in your ways as instruments of your salvation. Through the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take a moment of silence reflection. We are a people of remembrance and a people of anticipation. We remember Christ coming in weakness to save us. We anticipate Christ coming again from our power to make all things new. Remember that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is our inheritance kept for us in heaven. Though we do not see God, we love God. Though we do not see God now, we believe in him.
Bow your heads with me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin the season of Advent, help us to realize Realize the reality of the world we live in. And help us to dream and to hope of the world that might be. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand the things that you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with the Advent season, we're going to change things up a little bit. We've been doing some historical stuff through the summer. We'll have two texts every week in the season of Advent. One will come from the prophet Isaiah, and one will come from one of the epistles written by Paul, or, or, or Peter, or attributed to them anyway. Um, the reason for that is to tie the Old Testament into the New Testament and to show the uh, message of Advent. And so today's reading comes to us from Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. The mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known among your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the year. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. And our reading from the New Testament comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, as I mentioned, we just finished what we call in the church world ordinary time. Ordinary time is that time of most of life. There are special moments in life. There are special highlights. There are special things that we anticipate. But for the most part, Life is about ordinary time. It is about working, or it is about some sort of thing that you do, gardens that we keep, lawns that we mow, garden, you know, uh, houses that we keep up, whatever. It's ordinary time. That fills the church world from Pentecost all the way up into this first week of Advent. And then in the church world, there are two seasons that have deep meaning outside of ordinary time. One is the season of Advent, and the other one is the season of Lent. And both of those lead up to two significant events that frame God's salvation. Advent leads up to the coming birth of Christ, and Lent leads up to the death and the resurrection of Christ. And so as we watched throughout the summer, we took the summer, we, we did the books of Samuel, we learned the history and we reflected on some of the things that God was doing and some of the things that we need to know. But now with Advent, it marks a new tone, a new time for us. It is a season that is largely lost in our world. We don't like Advent very well, much the same as we don't like Lent. Advent is a time or a season in which we are called to do some inventory taking. Advent literally means the beginning of something or the start of something. It's the beginning of a brand new church year. This is the first Sunday in what we call year B, the three-year cycle that the church has. It's the first Sunday 
of a brand new church here. So it's the beginning of something. But Advent's also the end of something. It's what we do when we bring the year to an end. We understand that when we bring the year to an end, everything that we've experienced is less than the best. Less than what God intended. Less than what we hoped for. If you'll remember, we went through Samuel, and here's this glorious history. And the longing for out of Hannah's prayer for God to sing the king. And God sent the king. And by the time we get to the end of Samuel, we realize that things aren't any better. That with the king and all that was hoped for with the king, he still didn't fix things. In fact, things are going to get worse if we were to follow the history through. That's what brings it to the end of the year. Always less than what we hope for. Advent marks that season where it's a brand new year. There's renewed hope. There's some of the glimpses of glory like we did in Samuel where we saw the king. We saw David. We saw some amazing stuff. Some of those glimpses of glory we hold on to and we hope for a world in which that is the norm. Advent is a season of longing and preparing for something more. Psalm 80 was the psalm that was assigned to this Sunday. We had a very repetitive phrase in that. You and I as the congregation in response to Lynn this morning kept saying, Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we might be saved. We said that over and over again. We also said, stir up your might to save us. When I read to you the words of the prophet, the prophet said, oh, that you would come down and that you would rend the heavens and come to the earth. I want you to think about those two statements. them as I think they were written. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine upon us that we can be saved. Stir up your might. Save us and deliver us. Or maybe let me read the prophet as I think the prophet would want to be heard. Oh God that you would rend the heavens and you would come down. Why would those words be written? Why would this idea of God coming and God saving and God rescuing and God rending the heavens and God somehow coming to earth displaying his power. What would life be like to invoke such desperation? Where the longing for God's restoration is held in words of passion, words that keep being repeated, restore us, restore us, let your face shine on us. Rescue us. Save us. I would suggest this morning that most of us would never think of those words. The place that the people that wrote those words were in is nowhere indicative of the lives that most of us lead here this morning. Only people who are desperate long for God to come. Only people who are somehow, in a sense, caught in something, cry out, rescue me. Most of us are not in that situation. 
Most of us are comfortable. Most of us are satisfied. The primary characteristics of the Christian faith are to be happy. Everything going well. Life being good. But I will tell you that the psalmist and the prophet wrote the words because life wasn't so good. It's not that we're dissatisfied, that there's no dissatisfaction in life, that there's no sense of being rescued. It's just that God is not really the one who we look to to rescue us. We seek ways to eliminate our dissatisfaction outside of God. In fact, God is kind of the last resort. It's nothing for my phone to get a text message or somebody to post on a Facebook page that I have, or somebody to tweet something that says something like, my mother was rushed to the hospital, pray! <laughs> Some sort of desperation. Something not going well. That's kind of an interruption into our world. It's not something we really think about. But Advent calls us to that. And it calls us to look at life and to see life and to say, there's got to be more. When we're dissatisfied, we seek to eliminate that dissatisfaction with increased pleasure. Maybe it's more things. That's what the season is all about, more things. Maybe it's new relationship. If I just had, could move on from this relationship into this one. Life would be satisfying. Maybe it's a better job. Maybe it's something in the way of the newest technology. Somehow, dissatisfaction never really goes away. It's just that we seek to find its remedy in different ways. But more importantly, dissatisfactions are purely self-focused. It's no longer about the we. If I'm dissatisfied in life, it's because I'm dissatisfied with what's going on in my life. I'm bored, or I'm somehow depressed, or I'm discouraged, or I'm whatever. Seldom do we ever get to the place where we're heartbroken over the condition of our world. The psalmist and the prophet write their words, not because they as individuals were somehow dissatisfied, but they looked around. It isn't restore me, O oh God, it's restore us, O oh God. Rescue us. Rend the heavens and come down. So we can be saved. When was the last time that you were really heartbroken over the conditions that you saw in other people? When is the last time you looked around and you saw things going on in our world and it broke your heart? When is the last time you walked our streets in our community or drove down the road and you saw something and you just said, God, we need your help. I was thinking about the whole idea of the political hot potato called immigration this week. I was reading an article on it. It's a hot button issue. As you know, I'm not liberal and I'm not conservative. You don't know what I am. It doesn't really matter what side of the fence you're on with immigration. But you've got to ask yourself the question. In a world in which we have so much, we are in my house, we are literally running out of room in a two-car garage for all of our stuff. We have so much. And what we can't get in the garage, we got up in the attic. And what we don't have in the attic, we got stuffed in closets. And what we can't get in the closets, we have under beds. How in a world in which we have so much abundance can there be people who at the cost of their own life are willing to leave their families with nothing but the clothes on their back in hopes of coming into this country so that they can have enough. 
whether they do it illegally or they do it legally, what would be the condition of someone? What would make you, with just the clothes on your back, walk away from your house and go somewhere else in hope of a better life? When you think about it, it breaks your heart that in a world of abundance there are people with so little. They would leave everything to come to be a part of us. The Ferguson issue, whatever side you're on, does it break your heart that there's a group of people who, because of the color of their skin, feel as though they're always the one at the brunt of the injustice. Does it break your heart that when a decision is reached by a grand jury that there have been enough things that have gone on people question the legitimacy of our system? Does Ferguson break your heart? When was the last time that you looked outside of your little world and you cried out, God, Fix our world. Fix the broken homes that we see. Fix the foolish choices that people make that hurt others. Fix crime and injustice. Fix poverty. Fix sickness and disease. Fix greed and materialism. Fix the lonely plight of the aging. Fix the war-torn parts of our world. Fix political corruption. Fix the ongoing damage to, to our environment. Fix us! When is the last time that seeped its way into our hearts? <coughs> I see so many young families in our community I see children who probably had no opportunity because of that lostness. And my heart breaks. I see parts of our world in which machine guns and tanks are a daily occurrence. We have no idea. We're fat and sassy. We have so much. But does our world, when we look around it, does it cause us at all to say, God, fix us. Rend the heavens. Come down, O oh God, and save us. The writer of the prophet uttered the fact that God needed to come down. He uttered it with an eye to the past. God, come and save us. Rid the heavens and come down. Why? Because we look back and we saw the awesome things that you did, things that we weren't even looking for. We remember the times when you intervened. Perhaps the writer was thinking about Abraham in a world full of spiritual darkness, and God came down and encountered him and called him out. Perhaps the writer was remembering when God did the awesome thing with Noah, cleansed the earth, brought about a new birth for creation. Maybe he was thinking about God's mighty hand of deliverance when he took Israel out of Egypt in this place of captivity and people crying out, yearning, oh God. Perhaps the writer was thinking of that great act of salvation, God bringing them out. Maybe the writer was thinking about God appearing on Sinai. But the writer remembered the time when God moved and the mountains quaked 
and the crises of the day was remedied by God's dramatic action. That's what Paul tells us about in 1 Corinthians as well. He tells us what God did in Christ Jesus. The greatest crises the world has ever known. The idea of salvation being known to all people. God did in sending Christ. The writer tells the Corinthians, you were set apart, past tense. You were made into God's people. You were given grace, past tense. You were infused with God's favor and giftedness. You were enriched, past tense, in the blessings of the covenantal promise. And now you're awaiting something. It's interesting that all of God's acts in history remedied something, but he never fixed it total. And so God sends Christ into the world to fix it total. But we look back and we say our world is still broken. And so the writer says, not just that we look back and we see what God did in Christ Jesus, what God did in all of those amazing acts. But the writer tells the Corinthians, while you're awaiting the revealing, Christ revealing, the unveiling when Christ comes again. There was a deep sense that God had intervened to accomplish some form of rescue, that God had rendered the heavens at some point and come down and done something, but it was still unfulfilled. And so God rendered the heavens and Christ came in the form of human flesh. writer tells us that we have to await something else because there's something more, there's something better, there's a deep sense of longing that has to come into our heart. And so all people somehow have what God intends for our world. Just like the experience we had this past year when we read Samuel. And we realize it didn't end well. Just like the prophet Isaiah looking around at people in exile, they look forward to Messiah. The works of Christ are still not complete, causing us to cry out, leaving us to hope for, long for the day of the kingdom. Advent is our opportunity to measure life. Life not just for me, but life for all. And begin a deep sense of longing for the promise of God in new life. So that when Christ's birth is actually celebrated some four weeks from now, we are reminded again of God's amazing goodness and grace. And we long for that time Christ can come again and set everything right for that. Let us pray. Father, thank you for these words. Seal them into our hearts. Make this Advent something special. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
our salvation as we await your coming. May we be renewed and healed. 
And when that hour that no one knows comes and we have been gathered from the four corners of your good and gracious creation, we will be seated together in your grace, praising you to the ends of eternity. God in community, holy in one, and all of God's children said, Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall be to your saints in the joy of your kingdom. Lord God, we bring before you those who have needs, those who offer up sense of hope in your great rescue. We pray for safe travels for those who will be traveling not only through this weekend, but through the holidays. We pray, Father, for little Drew who has diabetes. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling this day, those whose lives need assistance where they live. We pray, Father, for our community, young families, older people, those who have hopes and dreams. Help us, Lord God, to be a people who would see those hopes and dreams come to pass as instruments of your glory. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for that which needs fixing. Fix us, O oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he died, took bread, and he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, hey, eat, this is my body which is given for you. In the same way, he took a cup, saying that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Blood that is shed for the remission of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death and his resurrection until he comes again. Our table is now open. The body of Christ given to you. given to you. God, as these are sent forth bearing these holy gifts, we ask that those who receive from them may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. And we look back to see what great things God has done for us. We look around us to see the mission field for God's unfolding salvation. We look forward to seeing the great day of Advent when our Lord comes again. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us with a feast from the cross, renewed our union with Christ.
Christ through his Spirit, be given us a foretaste of our eternal kingdom that is to come. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace, for we are. Bye, Christ.